chapter number 6 and verse number 5 is where we'll look. We'll just read a few verses here. Ephesians chapter 6 from verse 5. I'm going to have you stand one more time. Just get the blood flowing just one more time as I'm going to have you sitting for a couple hours now and uh, just want to make sure that nobody falls asleep on me. Okay? I do have, I've got two hymn books up here this week. Um, so if anybody decides to nod off, I got you. All right? <clears throat> and I can reload if necessary. Jason, you've got a couple over there, right? He, he can reload me whenever I need it, okay? Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 5. The Bible says, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart, as unto Christ. Not with eye service, as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will doing service, as to the Lord and not to men knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall be received of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And ye, masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing threatenings, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. You may be seated this afternoon. As we come here in our text, we see... Uh, that we're talking about servants and masters, talking about how the Lord tells us that as servants, we are to yield to the master. We are to yield to those who are of authority in our lives. Now, I want to take our thought this afternoon from verse number five. Just read all of that for the context of the scripture, but verse number five is where we'll be preaching from and taking our thought and, and looking at it more of a topical type message here today. Now listen, I don't preach topical all the time. I don't preach expositionally all the time. I think we get a pretty good dose of it all the way around. Uh, you get a little bit of here, a little bit. If you want a topical message, come get in one of the studies that we have on Wednesday night. My goodness, if that's not, if that's not expositional rather, then I don't know of anything that is. And when I preach through the tabernacle, now I bring that up because I've had people say that they don't like uh, someone who preaches topical. Jesus preached topically. So I struggle with that um, because my Savior preached a topical about every time that he preached. He didn't preach line upon line. Precept. I know the Bible tells us to, and we do. But I just want you to understand something here this afternoon. It takes both to build a church. It takes both to strengthen the body of Christ. You find me a guy who will just preach expositionally, he's missing a lot. You find me somebody who will just preach topically, he's missing a lot, okay? So it, it takes a little bit of both. And uh, so... It, Come, hey, if you come Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, you'll get some of both. <laughs> hey, man, how about that? All right? So uh, looking here in verse number five, the Bible says, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Now, that word heart right there shows... It means the thoughts, your thoughts, your thoughts. Not talking about the organ inside of your body that pumps blood. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about your thoughts or feelings. Well, what have we talked about in the past? Or what? Our mind, right? We always relate our mind to being in our, in our brain, right? But in our mind, have singleness of your heart, which is your thoughts, your feelings. A reference to the singleness of mind means, Brother Mike Brown, that we are unwavering. Being unwavering. Now, isn't that something that a Christian should be? A Christian should be unwavering in, in where we are. We need to be one who is settled. One who is solid. We need to be one who is settling our mind. Having a settled mind. If I am one that has a settled mind, then I am one that believes this Bible. I'm one that can't be wavered on this Bible. I'm one that when the Bible says it, I accept it. Do I like it all the time, Brother Tom? No. I don't like it. Do I fight it from time to time, Brother Tom? Yes. But at the end of the day, Brother Peter, who's right? The Bible. The Bible's right. The Word of God is right, whether I like it or whether I don't like it. I've used this illustration several times. I don't think that the speed limit ought to be 55. It'd be much better for me if it was 85. 
I can get where I want to go. Miss Julie said, hallelujah, right there. She makes it that way anyway, don't she, Brother Mike? Maybe 75, anyway. But that does not change the fact that it's wrong if I do 85 in a 55, right? Just because I want the Word of God to say something else does not mean that it's going to. All right, kind of we talked about this one about truth. Just because I make up my own truth does not mean that it's truth. All right, so let's look this afternoon here at settling your mind. Settling your mind here in Ephesians 6, 5 through 9. And uh, we just pray that God will help us in this time. Brother Peter, how about you pray for us? Amen. I believe this is our 17th message in the mind series, 17th or 18th message. I may have had a two-parter in there too, so uh, I know it's the 17th actual message that we've actually written on this. So we've looked at the mind quite a bit, and we, we begin looking at some uh, some things in our lives to try and help us throughout this time. And uh, several weeks ago, I, I preached about having an open mind. If you'll remember, I talked about the openness of our mind and in our day uh, that that would mean a mind living in our day that would mean a mind that is not hard and not fast towards anything because they tell you in this day oh we're to have an open mind you just you're just too closed minded you're just too narrow minded and and I would say yes I am narrow minded because my God's narrow minded my, my God tells me that narrow is the way, right? So I, I should be narrow-minded as well. But when I was talking about being open-minded, having an open mind, it was being open to the things of God. And, and, and whether whether we liked it or whether we didn't like it, we're to keep our eyes on the Scripture. The script, being scripturally open-minded is being open to the truth of God's Word. Now today we'll examine the idea of having a settled mind. Having our mind settled in the things of God, which is a reference to having a mind that is made up. Let me ask you a question here this afternoon. Are there things in your life that are not up for debate? Sure, we all got those things. I would hope we all had those things that were that sound on, were that secure, that I don't care what you bring to me, it really doesn't matter because I've got Scripture showing where I stand. There are certain things that I'm now... Not because somebody told me this, but because I've got Scripture. I've all but been accused of standing where I stand on certain things because of where somebody else has stood. No, I'm a man. I stand where, I don't care where another man stands. I stand to where I believe the Bible tells me to stand. Amen. If the Bible's right, and that's my authority, then somebody come to me and say, you're wrong on that. I'll say, show me. I talked about that this morning, right? Show me where I'm wrong. Well, I just don't think that, and that's what you think, because I'm going to give you Scripture why I stand there. And then I'll give you Scripture why I do what I do, and I'll give you Scripture why I say what I say. Now, if you can't do that, then guess what? We ain't got a whole lot to talk about. Amen. All we got to do at that point is you get right. Nobody likes that idea, do we? Mm. Well, if the Bible proves me to be wrong, guess what I need to do? I need to get right. Amen. But I'm settled on some things. I have a mind that is made up. It's settled and it's, it's sure. Our text verse paints a great picture of what having a made-up mind looks like. Look with me in verse number 5, Ephesians 6. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh. The call here is for a subservient attitude towards someone with authority over you. Now, would you agree with me if that's scriptural? Amen. That's where I just, I mean, I just read it. So. That's what the Bible says. The call here is that we're subservient. This definitely goes against our flesh. Amen. It's completely contrary to my nature. It's completely contrary to your nature too. 
I just said mine to make you feel good about yourself. But it's completely, Brother Peter, it's completely contrary to our nature. Amen. Nobody wants to be surrendered to another person. Nobody, but listen, I told somebody this a while back. I can't remember who I was talking to now. I said, but look, I don't care how much money you got. I don't care how big you are or how popular you are. You always have to answer to someone. Does not matter. Even, even the great, greatest CEOs of all time, just a billionaire that pops into my mind is not for his theology, but Mark Cuban. I said, watch him on Shark Tank. I don't know if y'all know who he is. He owns Dallas Mavericks. He owns all these different businesses. Da, 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 da. Well, you can say, oh, well, he's got billions. Yeah. Guess who he answers to? The board. Yeah. If his stock, if, if the company he owns is publicly traded, guess who he answers to? Exactly. He always answers to somebody. I don't care how big you get or how much you think you know. We always, so at my house, I'm, hey, I'm where it ends, baby. That's right. I'm in charge at my. <laughs> y'all do realize, y'all do realize that God has the final say in my house. Amen. Always answer to somebody, even at my house. Even though God does give me the final answer in the house, it's on me, Miss Cat, if I don't obey it. It's on me as the man if I don't obey it. Listen, if I go the way that Miss Nicole wants to go, and let's say she's wrong, but just to appease her, I go that way. God's not saying, Miss Nicole, why did you do that? No, God's saying, Bo, why did you do that? Yeah. Whose fault is it? No. Mine. Mine. Amen? So we always got somebody that we've got to answer to and be obedient to. And it goes against our flesh. I understand that. And it's contrary to our nature, which is why we would need a mind to be made up and a made up mind and a settled mind, if you will, in order to accomplish it. Man, I get to talking about the house and he slides back two pews. My goodness gracious. Boy, that didn't take long, did it? I'm sorry, brother. I'm sorry. I'll get her. I'll get her back. Don't worry about it. I got her. I got something coming. This is a case with many things that the Bible asks of us. Okay? From the structure of our families to the properly stewarding of our finances to even the prioritizing of our lives. We've talked about these different things. But unless the mind gets settled, meaning made up, we'll never do these things in a consistent manner. I will never have control over my finances that God gets the first fruits. I'll never, I'll never, if I don't have a made up mind, I will never get to the point that I understand the outline of how he has designed the home to be ruled. I'll never get there. I'll never have, I'll never have a settled or made up mind if I can't understand that. I'll never be able to prioritize my time without having a settled or made up mind. When studying having a made up or a settled mind, we are Fortunate that the Bible tells us about a, it doesn't tell us about a singleness of mind, what that means, but it does tell us about a double minded man. So we're fortunate here to understand that the Bible gives us a, the opposite of that. We're able to look at it being double minded. We can examine both in order to gain a real understanding of what it means to have a settled mind. Number one, go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. At the beginning of this message, I could probably ask the question, explain to you what a settled mind is on the Scripture. And every one of us would have probably said, yes, I'm settled. At the end of this, we're going to probably look and say, I got some work to do. Hey Amen. You know what preaching does though, right? Helps us to grow. Ah, uh, let's see. Second Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 3. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is Christ. 
Simplicity here literally means singleness. Literally means singleness. Christ was the epitome of being single-minded. He was the epitome of being single-minded, okay? Simplicity literally means that, that singleness, okay? So how does he do that? How is he single-minded? In John chapter 8, verse 29, And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. How many of us can say that this afternoon? How many of us can say that we do always those things that please him? Anybody here? I didn't think so. I'm the same way. The reason Jesus was single-minded was because of the principle that he had lived his life by. Brother Peter, his life that he lived, he lived it in singleness of mind, saying my mind's made up. I'm secure in this. If man says it, great. But if it doesn't line up with my father, then I'm not doing it. Right? So that's where we need to get to. Who are we supposed to be like? We're supposed to be Christ-like, right? So in order to do that, then we must have a singleness of mind, meaning a settled mind in, in, in our life. So all that mattered to him was walking in obedience to the Father. Now, I would love to tell you that that's my makeup. I would love to tell you, Brother Reggie, that all that I do is to please the Father. And if you can say that and God not strike you dead, please come tell me about it because I'd like to shake your hand. Right? I would, love to, I would love to have that. Now, I'm not saying that we can't because the Bible plainly teaches that we can. John 4.34 tells us, Jesus saith unto him, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Now that, that's Jesus speaking there. He said that's, what, that's his lot in life, if you will. That is what he is sent to this earth to do. He has a settled mind. He has a singleness of mind that he's not swayed by what everybody else thinks, not swayed by where everybody else goes. He's just doing the will of his Father. Now to see this in action, turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. I want you to see this in action with his life. We look no further than the battle, the battle that we find here with the adversary in the wilderness. In Matthew chapter number four. Matthew chapter number four. Never thought I'd sweat this much in November in Maine, but my goodness. Woo! Turn the air conditioning on. My goodness, it feel like August again, don't it? Ha. Matthew chapter 4 and verse number 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit in the wilderness and tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Verse 5, Then the devil taketh him up in the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give His angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again, the devil taketh him up into the exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world in glory and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me, then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and only, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Notice with me here, we've talked about this in, in, in times past, but when temptation came, Christ never gave in to the flesh. 
You do realize today he was just as much man as you and I. When tempted the way we're tempted from time to time, Christ never gave in. How often, and I'm thankful to say this afternoon, Miss Suzanne, I don't always give in. There are times whenever my walk with God is strong. There are times that my, my prayer life is strong. My devotional life is strong. My, my extra reading, man, I'm just, mm, man, hallelujah, I've got this. And then there's Monday mornings. <laughs> Amen. To where you wake up and you feel like, oh my goodness, what happened? And the temptations come. And the next thing you know, you're out. You're gone. Listen, it can happen to any of us. Y'all realize today how you backslide out of church? How you get out of church? Anybody, anybody, anybody want to take a stab at it? No, it's not goose. Anybody want to take a stab? One step at a time. Step at a time. Better way of, for service is one service at a time. You know what? Nobody ever just automatically is out and 15 services, I ain't been back. No, they missed that first one. Then they missed that second one. And it's one step at a time, right? You got to be real, real careful. You got to be real careful that we understand that we get tempted. And we get tempted to miss that one. Then we get tempted to miss that second one. I backed out of service, or backed out of church a long, long, long time ago. I was out of church for several years. And uh, you know what got me out of church? I missed one. Then I missed another. Then it started getting real easy to stay at the house. And now I thought, well, I'm working on these Sundays. Well, even if I had a Wednesday off, I didn't go because I'd already missed Sunday. What's the point? Well, the point is to get around God's Word. That's the point. Well, I had to work Sunday morning. Well, I could have gone Sunday night. I had to work Sunday night. Well, I could have gone Sunday morning. All that, you miss it one at a time. So when temptation comes, don't give in to the flesh, but instead stay totally committed, totally obedient to the Scriptures as Christ did because what did He say every time? For it is... How did He combat temptation? With the Bible. Alright, y'all ready? Some of you Bible scholars, y'all can help me with this one. Okay. I don't want to tithe. I don't want to tithe. Find it. Pray about it. Find the scripture to where I don't have to. All right? I just don't want to go to church today. Okay. We have those days. Have those... Pray about it. Then find me the scripture that says to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. I can find the opposite. Right? You see where I'm going with this? Talk about having a simple mind. Or not a simple mind. A singleness of mind. Having a singleness of mind. Having a settled mind. A mind that's made up. That you know what? If the Bible says that I'm just going to live it. I'm just going to go for it. Am I going to mess up, Brother Tom? Yeah, I'm going to mess up. Brother Mike, am I going to am I going to stump my toes and bump my nose? Sure I am. I'm, I'm going to scuff my nose up from time to time where I fall over. But am I going to use that excuse to live like I want to? No, I'd better not. I'd better not, Brother Danny. I'd better stay with the Word of God, especially if I'm a child of God. I'd better stay with the Word of God. So the singleness of mine, the best example I can give you is what we just saw there in Matthew 4. And that's what we ought to strive for. Now, here's a few things that we can consider in this evening that keeps us from being a settled mind, keep us from having a settled mind. Truth doesn't change with circumstances. We talked about that this morning. Nor is truth subjective as we talked about this morning. By who is involved <laughs> in those certain circumstances. I've met people that stand one way until it affects their house. Oh, I can't stand there now. I know people who are completely against homosexuality until little Precious comes out and says, I'm a lesbian. Amen. Or little Sweet Pea comes out and says, I like men. 
the men. Well, maybe, maybe they were made that. No, they weren't made that way. You didn't believe that way five years ago. What are you talking about now? Just cause it, well, you think different affect your house. I, I hope I don't. I hope I don't think different. I hope I stand with the Bible. Amen. I hope I stand with God. I've got family members I love dearly, and I, oh man, and, and, and I think the world of them. But I stood with the Bible several years ago, and I will continue to stand there. What are we going to do? Are we going to be worried about what man says? Or are we going to be worried about what the Bible says? I'm worried about what the Bible says. You can't let your circumstances change. I, I just dealt with this. I know a man that stood. I know his pastor. I know where he stood. And now that it's affected his life, Brother Mike, I don't stand there no more. I think there's a little latitude. Oh, no they ain't. No, sir. Well, I think that means that this, no, no, no. Why does it change? You weren't enlightened to anything new. No, you just, your circumstances change, sir. Amen. And since your circumstances change, you feel like truth has changed. No, we established that this morning. There's but one truth. Truth does not change. Proverbs 20, verse 10, Divers weights and divers measures, both of them are alike abomination to the Lord. Hey, listen, let me say this. The Pharisees were wrong. Jesus rebuked them. Peter was wrong, so he moved back to Rome. I mean, Peter was wrong, so Jesus rebuked him. <laughs> Just picking. Just picking. Y'all need a little. But the Pharisees were wrong. Jesus rebuked them. Hey, look, y'all do realize that this Bible, God's no respecter of person, so why would we think that His Bible would be? Well, but I serve Him, Brother Tom, so I get away with a little bit more. No, I get away with less because where much is given, much shall be required. Amen. Amen. I know we don't like that. I, I know it's tough, and that's just mean preaching, but that's just Bible. Truth is truth. It's hard. It's fast. And it's blind to all other variables. Amen. It doesn't care who's involved. It sees every situation, every situation equally across the board. Whether it's your family, whether it's my family, whether it's your daughter, whether it's my daughter, whether it's your kids, whether it's my kids, whether it's your grandkids or my future grandkids. No matter whose it is, the Bible sees it the same. Amen. So how do you think that we should see it? If we have a singleness, if we have a settled mind, a mind that's made up, how, Brother Danny, are we to see what's happening? We're to see it the way that God would see it. That's why the Bible says in Proverbs 17, 15, He that justifieth the wicked, now get a hold of this, and he that condemneth the just, even they both are abominations to the Lord. Brother Peter, what he's saying there is somebody that justifies the wicked is just as bad as somebody that condemns the just. I didn't say that. Look it up yourself. The Bible said that. Amen. Proverbs 17, 15. You can go there, write down, put it on your hand, whatever. I want you to look at that later on. So we look at the single mind. Single mind, but let's look at the double mind. Go with me to the book of James. James chapter 1. As we'll learn from the Scriptures, being double-minded is a reference to someone who is easily influenced. They may change like the wind because they are built that way and because of their carnality. Here's the good news though. They can be fixed. They can be fixed by obedience to the Scripture. I know men right now that stand in a pulpit on Sunday morning and can easily be swayed by somebody. Amen. All it takes is for a prominent member to come up and say, I don't like this. And I don't think we need to do this. 
And he says, okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Just keep giving me my paycheck. Just keep, just don't be mad at me. Don't call me names. Hey, y'all just ain't got that kind of pastor. I hope y'all are all right with that. But I just ain't the one. Amen. Not that everything I say goes. I'm not a dictator. But what I am is who God's put in this position to be the pastor of this church. And I know, hey, I, I didn't agree with everything my pastor did, Brother Danny. But you know what? I said, yes, sir. You know why I said that? Because I knew, Brother Peter, God wasn't going to look at me and say, Bo, why didn't you get on to him? Why didn't you fix him? Wasn't my job. Wasn't my job, Lord. That's your job. If he is wrong, that's on you to reprimand him. Amen. So, I might, yeah, okay, that's great, Pastor. We'll do that. Now, if he asked my opinion, I'd give him my opinion. And, you know, if he asked for my two cents, I'd give him my two cents. But outside of that, I said, you're the man God put here. And you're the man that I believe God put here. I believe God can tell you what needs to be done. Amen. Amen. And that's, that's, that is the way it should be enforced, Brother Peter. There are some churches that don't have a man that'll do that. Pastor, you know, I really think we ought to do this. Well, do you really? Okay, well, that sounds good. I'll, 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 I'll do that. But I, I don't think I don't think Jessica's going to like that, Tom. So, but well, she's not going to like that. So, it's a double-minded man. I might make you feel good about this over here. Make you feel good about. Hey, listen. How about we just go with God and not worry about what everybody else says? That's a double-minded man. A double mind. I can't. I can't. I can't handle it. I can't handle a double-minded man. As a hypocrite, that's double standard. Woo, boy, you want to get me fired up? Start talking about double standards. I can't. I can't deal with it. All right. So James chapter number one, verse number two. I had you go there. I got off on a tangent. I just shot that rabbit. It's good. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this: that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect. An entire wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. He that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in some of his ways. That ain't, that, ain't, that ain't what it said. What did it say? Oh, and all means all, and that's all all means, ain't it? A-double-L. With double-mindedness being the opposite of single-mindedness. Let's look at the context of this Scripture real quick. The, the context of this passage. Better help us understand. Verse number 5 tells us in context, he's praying for wisdom. Right? Is that what you see? We're told to ask in faith and to not what? Waver. And to not waver. That means I'm sure that this is what I want. I'm to ask in faith saying, God, I need wisdom. The only thing God is ever a liberal on is He gives you wisdom liberally. But we're to ask in faith and not waver. And not waver. Wavering is where the double-mindedness comes in. When we start wavering on things, it comes into play. It would be praying, but doubting. It would be praying, but not believing. It would be, well, God, I need wisdom, but I don't know that I can handle it. God, I need this, but I don't think you can give it to me. That's, that's praying and wavering. Do I sound like I'm single in mind? Do I sound like I'm settled in what I'm wanting at that point? No, I'm double-minded. I'm thinking, okay, well, this is what I want, but uh, I can't handle it. God, you might not give it to me. Then I'm not praying in faith. I'm wavering, which shows a double 
mindedness. The pitfall of being double minded is that it robs you of blessings. It robs each one of us of blessings whenever we're that. Look in verse 7. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. He plainly tells us right there, if you're going to do this wavering, if you're going to do this as a double-minded man, don't even expect to get anything. Because I'm not going to give it to you. It affects every area of your life. Pastor, how do you know it affects every area of your life? Look at verse number 8. Unstable in how many of his ways? All, right? He's unstable in all his ways. Verse number 8 tells us he is unstable in all his ways. The next time being double-minded is discussed, look over in chapter 4, verse 7. Next time it's discussed, we find it in James 4, 7, and 8. We're almost finished up, I promise. No, yeah, I've heard that before. <laughs> Submit, verse 7, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Do you believe that? Do you believe if we resist the devil, he'll flee from you? Amen. Oh, we ought to. The Bible said it's true, right? How many of us pray that way, knowing that it'll happen? <laughs> yeah, we'll get back in the scripture. Verse number 8, he tells us to draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. Who? You're double-minded. Now, notice, he said to do what with your hearts? Purify them. Now, what did we establish right from the very beginning, Miss Suzanne, that our heart was? Our mind. He's telling us to purify. You know why we need to purify our hearts, meaning our minds? You know why? They're tainted. They're tainted. By our unbelief, they're tainted. Not our unbelief in salvation. That's not what I'm talking about. But our unbelief that God can do. Why? 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 It baffles me. And if you can answer it, please do. Because I need this from time to time. Why in the world can I put my faith in the God of heaven to save me, forgive me of my sin of unbelief, and that I can go to heaven because I'm a child of God. But I can't trust Him to meet a little bitty piddly need that I might have at the house. Right? But I can believe Him to change my destination when I'm, die, when I'm dead. But I can't, believe, I can't trust Him to take care of my fuel bill this month. I, now listen, I understand. Hey, we live in Maine. Fuel oil is ridiculous. I get it. Pellets are ridiculous. A cord of wood is ridiculous. Right? But do we have confidence God to get us through it? Amen. If having 50, 60 degree temperature on November, whatever this is, is it proof that God's going to get us through this? Yes, Amen. Right now, two years ago, we had snow on the ground. I went and voted two years ago in the snow. I'm talking 20 degree weather. And I'm like, glory. This year, I'm like, 60 degree weather. Glory. <laughs> Amen. Not because I don't like cold, not because I don't like snow. I just don't like the fuel bill. Yeah. Amen. But God can, but are we praying with that kind of faith? Are we doing, looking at God who can take care of us in that? The context reveals that the believers in this condition haven't made up their mind and haven't settled their mind. They're double minded. Oh, yeah, they are saved, but they're divided in their allegiance. They're having to be told to submit to God and resist the devil. Look with me in, in verse number 8. Draw nigh to God. He said to draw nigh to God. Now, in verse number 7, he says, submit yourselves. They're being told to submit, therefore to God. But then they're being told to resist the devil. Now, help me out with something here this afternoon. But wouldn't that just be something that naturally happens to a child of God? To submit to God? Wouldn't you think that that's just natural? I got saved. It ought to be natural to submit to God. Right? It is if we're living for God. But Brother Peter, if I'm still living for me, as let's just be honest, we all do from time to time, then the Bible has to tell me to submit to God 
and flee the devil. Why does it have to tell me that? Because there are times whenever I resist God and flee to the devil. Not from, to. Y'all look at me and say, Pastor, you ought to be walking better than that. Yeah? I'll get you a mirror here in a minute too. Amen. We're all guilty, guys. We're all guilty. But that's no reason to say that, oh, well, Pastor, Pastor has a problem with it, so it must be all. No, don't use me as the measuring stick, man. We'll all fall in a ditch together. Amen. I've done told y'all that since day one. I was here over three years ago. I am not your measuring stick. Don't ever look and say, well, Pastor does it, so it must be all. Now, I try to live a clean life just so that I can please God, and I want y'all to have something that y'all can't look and say, I oh, don't live what you preach, right? I try to live what God tells me to do. But listen, I've got just as many problems, if not more, than any of y'all sitting in here. Amen. I ain't, I ain't, I ain't braggadocious. I'm just, I'm just being completely honest with you. But I've no reason for you to stumble because, oh, well, he does it or she does it or that person. Does. Oh, they walk with God. No, 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 no. How about we just look at God? Verse 8 says they are being told to draw nigh to God a place they should have already been. Why, why as a child of God do we have to be told to draw nigh to God? They're also in need of cleansing and purifying. Why? Because they don't have their mind settled. They don't have their mind made up about following God. Hey, y'all do understand, I've said this a lot, but we don't fall into sin. How many times have you said, oh, so-and-so, boy, they sure, they fell into sin. No, they didn't. Most time they willingly walked into it. Yeah. Worst case, worst case, they unknowingly walked into it. It wasn't falling in. They, they oh, well, no, this, this don't feel right. Well, I'll just keep trying a little bit more. No, this don't, no, I'll just go a little bit further. Now I get back here towards the back rows to where the sin really is in. Right? These people in this scripture, they're saved, but they're having to be told to draw nigh. Let me ask you a question here real quick. As a child of God this afternoon, are there times that scripture has to remind you to draw nigh to Him? Are there times that the Holy Ghost of God has to remind you to draw nigh to Him? Let me say this to you right now. I don't care how far you are. I don't care how far you've gotten. The Holy Ghost of God's dealing with you. Get it settled. Amen. Amen. But you don't know what I've done. And how many times I got to tell you I don't care? Oh, you mean you don't know I love you, but I don't care about your sin. Why? Because I'm not the one that's got to forgive it anyway, Brother Danny. God is. And guess what? He's already forgiven it. He's just waiting on you to come. He's just wanting you to acknowledge it. He just wants to bless you through that acknowledgement of knowing that, yes, I am, Lord, what you said I am. We allow the adversary to get a place in our lives. Remember we talked about the table. God hath prepared a table for me in the presence of mine enemies. Right? Psalm 23. We talked about that. I had a, a chair for the Lord and I had a chair for me. But how many times do we keep pulling the chair up for the Satan? The devil, oh, have you a seat. Have you a seat. No, 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 no. That's for me and the Lord. Here's what the double-minded this causes and we'll be finished up. The double mind is causes people to fall apart. Causes them to fall off like a wagon wheel would. Spiritually. One week, they're living for God in their own fire. One week, they're walking around the church saying, Miss Cat, I read this awesome devotional the other day. Oh, it blessed my heart in such a way. I went out and bought another one. Now I'm reading two devotion books. Oh, it just bled. Now I bought another one. Now I've got four or five going. It's just such a blessing. Oh, it's just such a blessing. That's the way they are. Walk around church. Then the next week. What you reading? Oh, I didn't read this week. 
Oh, really? How, how's your devotions? I've just been too down. What's wrong? Double-minded. Double-mindedness will get us out of where we're supposed to be. Never, 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 Miss Candy, is there something in Scriptures that is positive about a double-minded man? See, if it just said that a double-minded man would be struggling in this area, or a double-minded man would struggle in this area, I'd say, you know what? A ah, double-minded man probably isn't that bad because we all have those days. However, the Bible doesn't say in this way or that way. Miss Trish said a double-minded man is unstable in all, all of his ways. We have to make sure as a child of God this afternoon that we don't fall off, that we don't come off the wheels spiritually. If at one time your prayer life and devotion was something worth talking about, ask yourself why it's not today. Amen. If I was to come by and ask you, how's your devotion life? Would you lie to me? Remember we talked about this morning, I ain't your Holy Ghost. Or would you say, you know what, Pastor? Man, I'm struggling. Man, I'm struggling. My prayer life is barely existent. My devotion life, I don't have... Can you recommend a good devotion for a man, a good devotion for a lady? Can you, can you recommend a devotion for a teenager? Can you recommend a devotion for an old person? Yeah, we can do all of those. They got them for all of you. I'm going to be good. I'm going to be good. I, I, I'm going to be nice the rest of the day. I'm not. Just give me a minute. But you know, there's, Brother Peter, there's been folks that would never make any bones about it. They'd walk up and want to tell me about what they're reading. And I love it. You know why I love it? Because it shows you're hungry. I'm not going to question you on, oh, so you read that book? Well, what does page 37 say on the fourth page? No, I, am. I probably ain't read it myself. And if I did, I don't remember what was on that page. But what I am going to do is say, praise the Lord. Do you get anything out of it? Any time that you get alone with God, any time that you get around the house of God, any time that you open up that Bible, whether it's here, whether it's home, whether it's somewhere, or somewhere else, you should be able to have a spiritual takeaway. And if you can't, ask yourself why. Why is there no spiritual takeaway? Either he just didn't give me nothing to take away, or maybe there's something in me that's preventing me from taking something away. Maybe I just didn't like what I heard. Maybe I'm double-minded. That double-mindedness causes people to fall off the rails. One week, people are strong on convictions. The next week, they're all loosey-goosey. One week, we're strong on, we're going to stand this way and do this. The next week, eh, well, you know, I don't know. Who changed? Brother Mike, if the Bible said it yesterday, guess what it's going to say today? Same thing. If it said it 10 years ago, guess what it's going to say today? But yet, we... I've, we feel like we are learning more, so therefore we can act more against the Word of God. Wouldn't that be opposite? The more we learn, the closer we should walk with the Lord. One week we love our church, one week we love our pastor, the next we're disgruntled and then we're gone. I've seen it. Been around it. That, my friend, is a double-minded person. Nowhere in Scripture... Miss Jessica, will you find anything positive about a double-minded man? However, you find all kinds of negatives. So let me ask you a question. We're finished up. How settled are you this afternoon? How settled are you on what you believe? How settled are you on this is God's Word? How settled are you on this is God's house? How settled are you on this is the place that I married? And this is where I'm going to serve. Amen. How settled are you on, that's my pastor. Amen. Whether I like him or don't like him. Give me five. That's right. <laughs> there we go.
felt, felt a little nudge back there. <laughs> I, I thought it might have been Ninny. But how settled are we on these things? Are we settled on the things of God the way we should be? Right? Let's keep a settled mind. Yeah, that's good. Let's have a settled mind on the things of God. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Amen.